The purpose of this video is to go over chapter four in the proposal writing book, Effective Grantmanship for Funding by Coley and Schreinberg. Chapter four is the proposal overview. This is a very good chapter because it gives you an overview of what the grant uh, looks like, uh, what, it, what the proposal looks like for the grant. Um, so the first thing that they talk about is a letter of intent. The letter of intent is something that you would send out to the funder um, before you actually apply for the grant. What's great about that is it gives the funder the opportunity to reject your proposal before you spend hundreds of hours writing a 50-page proposal. So the letter of intent or letter of inquiry is just a brief one-page, two-page uh, letter. Think of it as a cover letter of sorts, but it's uh, it just tells them, here's your intent, you'd like to apply for this grant, this is your idea, and then they can respond back with either they're interested or they're not. They, If they're interested, they'll invite you to submit the full proposal. Um, there is also a cover letter as well, that's number two. Number three is a title page and an abstract. Um, I think that's self-explanatory. Uh, the, the abstract is usually pretty b brief. Uh, a lot of funders are pretty exact about the word count. So if it says 200 words and you put in 201 words, they'll reject your proposal. Um, so you definitely need to follow that. Um, and then you come to the need statement. That's number four in, in the list. The need statement is huge. It's a really important part of the proposal. It, it explains, obviously, what the need is. What is the problem? It tells you about the community. What's the context? So if the problem is, let's say, addiction, um, you can talk about all the consequences of addiction, why we need to solve addiction. You could talk about the particular area that you serve. So if you serve Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, um, you know, you sort of discuss that. So the need talks about the need or the problem or the dependent variable. And then number five is the project description. That tells you what is the program that you think will fix this or that you want funding for. That should also be your independent variable, so the thing that's gonna fix the problem, okay, or the thing that's gonna respond to the need. Number six in the list is the evaluation plan. This is a really, really important part. Usually it doesn't um, weigh that much into the score, but let's say if your whole proposal is scored on 100 points, the evaluation might be 15 points, but it is so important for future funding because the evaluation plan basically says, how are you gonna decide if this is successful or not? If you can't tell me with numbers or with data, that your program is successful, my assumption is that it's not successful and we just wasted a million dollars on you. So the evaluation plan is incredibly important. You need to know how to measure your variables, meaning the need or the dependent variable. You gotta measure them. Um, you have to make sure the program was effective, your intervention was effective, it was the way that you intended it to be, um, and then you have to sort of measure the clients afterwards. So let's say addiction. If addiction is the problem and I'm gonna fix it with CBT group therapy, I have to be able to measure addiction. And it's not just are you totally sober or are you not sober, or because if they're not sober, but you significantly reduce the amount of drugs that they were using, so say they were shooting heroin and now they're only smoking pot or marijuana, that's a huge improvement. That's a significant improvement. Um, but if you, if you say that full sobriety is the only measure of success, then your organization's a failure. So you have to think about how you're evaluating it. Um, the seventh thing in the list is budget, the budget, the actual budget, and budget justification. Um, so the justification is basically explaining why you need $50,000 um, for whatever area. Um, number eight, the applicant capability. So that really describes your organization. Why you? So maybe you have a great program plan, maybe it's a big problem, you know, addiction's a problem everywhere, but why your organization, not your competitor? So they might ask about that organizational chart. They might ask about your previous experience with this. Um, you may focus on other successful grants that you've run before. You may have a unique set of the board of directors. Um, there's also a difference between nonprofit or program related grants or university grants. So capability from a university, if a university wants to receive this grant, some of the things that they'll talk about is, well, we have a great library. We have a million articles or whatever, journals on reserve. 
Um, we have access to all this fancy software. Uh, you know, so what is unique about you? Nine, in here they say that it's future funding plans. Other people will call that sustainability. And really what that means is the government or whoever your funder is doesn't want you to be dependent upon them forever. If you say you're gonna fix this problem, well one, fix it, then you won't need our money anymore. But then two, if we stop funding you, how are you going to fund this in the future? How are you gonna make this sustainable? So sometimes folks just need that upfront money to kind of get that program started. And then they move to a fee for service program where the insurance companies fund the rest of it. Um, 10, letters of support. This is really, really important. Letters of support really comes from the organizations that you say you're gonna work with. So if you say you're trying to change the life of high school kids in the area, you wanna try to do some prevention before they get into substance use, that might be junior high, that might even be elementary school, well, do you have a letter of support from that school? And you can't just say a school district, you have to specifically name the school district, and then you need a letter of support from them to say, yes, we wanna do this, we wanna work on this project with them. The other thing is if you are writing a grant with another organization as an equal partner, well, then you need what's called an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding or Memorandum of Agreement. So you need some sort of idea, you know, the funder wants to see that you've actually been a grown up about it. You have a formal communication in writing, agreeing to who does what and how we're gonna handle this. Um, number 12 is appendix material. The one that I find particularly helpful is audited financial statements. So. For the most part, for grant writing, you have to show that your organization has been independently audited and you've passed through. And sometimes those audits can cost you $20,000. I mean, it is a lot of money. And so if you're a small organization, you might be able to do a smaller audit for say 5,000, um, but they definitely require that. There's a whole bunch of other things in there, sometimes job descriptions, sometimes they'll want um, the grant writer's CV, or resume, they'll limit you to a certain number of pages. Okay, so that's kind of the outline of the grant, still in chapter four here. They also talk about weighting and scoring. So again, if we go back to the RFP, which is the request for proposal, it's also the instruction document that will provide you all the information you need to apply for this grant. So you, that's the first thing you need to get. What is the RFP? Um, but they will also, what's really important in that RFP is they will talk to you about scoring and which part of the proposal um, is more important. So sometimes the need could be 50% or maybe it's only 20%. If the need is 50%, then you wanna put all your effort into making the most fabulous need statement possible. So you definitely wanna look at that. Uh, so that is uh, chapter four, the proposal overview.